before wait, before we dig into this, I just yeah. want to say how much I appreciate the phrase of sharing a blowjob with somebody. <laughs> right, I do. Love I think that. it really gives. First, I mean, I know that you say you give a blowjob, but sharing mm-hmm. it, it just gives it so much yeah. more preciousness. I suppose, like you're sharing a gift. Yeah. Well, it is a gift. But, it, but where it's like, but you're enjoying the gift too. Right. I think that's what it implies. I do yeah. like that. I like that. Of For like, sure. Of like, hey, do you want to share cunnilingus later tonight? <laughs> I, I like that too. <laughs> Boy, do I. <laughs> if you're happy with the same old ways of dating. If you enjoy sucking at communication. And you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships. Broaden your sexual horizons. Develop a better understanding of yourself or learn more about non-monogamy then you've come to the right place i'm jace i'm emily and i'm dedeker and this is the multi-amory podcast On this episode of the Multi Emory Podcast, we are answering your call in questions again. If you would like to have a question of yours discussed on this show, the best way that you can do that is to call in to our call in number, which is 678 MULTI05. Or if it helps you remember, the little jingle goes 678 MULTI05. Or, if you are international, you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. We don't have a jingle for that one. Yeah, leave us a voice message. We should come up with... On Facebook. It's just the same tune, you know? Yeah, you too. It's like when a chain, you know, that does a few different locations will do the same jingle and they'll just swap out, you know, Alhambra with, you know, Van Nuys, or they'll just Uh. sort of throw in another city name and sometimes it has to be, like, crammed into this (laughs) tiny space where they used to say one city. They'll know. just add an extra syllable and it'll yeah. be really awkward. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I'm so glad that we're Good. doing this again. I had so much fun recording it the last time, and I'm so glad that we have totally. people calling in again. It's it's great. Yeah, so just to give everyone a preview of what's coming up on this episode to keep you listening, uh, we've got a question about how to keep relationships casual. We have one about um, jealousy, about other relationships even if they're in the past just for them being Mm. important we have another one uh, about stis and um antibiotic resistant gonorrhea so fun stuff coming up in this episode we promise it is actually fun i know that sounds weird but it actually is fun fun and informative we learned a lot in in researching the question and are excited to talk about that Mm -hmm. so to get us started here we are going to talk um, about this very first voicemail, which we are going to listen to now. Hi, my name is David, and first off, I just wanted to thank all three of you for doing such an amazing job on this podcast. I've been listening for a few months now, and it's helped me a lot. So, my girlfriend and I recently opened up our relationship after two and a half years of monogamy. Um, I consider myself polyamorous, and I've had several non-monogamous relationships in the past but this is all completely new for her. Um, So we opened it up on her side first and she liked it. Um, And eventually she felt comfortable enough to open it up on my side too. Now she's comfortable with me having casual sex, friends with benefits and even caring for others. But the thought of me falling in love with someone else really freaks her out. And in fact, we've already had one catastrophe. For me, the line she's drawn is confusing because I love my friends dearly and I can even feel a degree of love with a casual partner. I've had discussions with her about our definitions of love and I've explained that my love for her won't decrease just because I love other people. But basically, I know her process and I think that until she falls in love with someone, she's not going to be able to fully understand what I mean. So my question is, for now, how do I approach dating without leading people on or jerking people around and hurting people? Thanks. All right. Well, I mean, I feel like that's a pretty common situation that crops up is mm-hmm. that fear of a partner falling in love with someone else. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost it almost feels universal at this point. Well, it's an interesting one oh, yeah. because I feel like it's 50-50 though. It's either the fear of falling in love or the fear of casual sex. Mm-hmm. That it tends mm-hmm. to be kind of one or the other for for people is more triggering. Is more fear inducing i guess yeah yeah so 
All right. First and foremost, I just want to clarify that while you might be able to do some things to be as honest as possible about what kinds of relationships you're looking for with new people, you can't control emotions that Mm -hmm. way. Uh, You know, you might do your best and still fall in love with somebody or somebody else might still fall in love with you. They might say, oh yeah, I'm totally fine with having this more casual relationship, but things happen, right? And also, yeah. if especially if you have some kind of specific restriction or some kind of specific yardstick, I guess, that you're trying to stay in line with of, you know, if you tell yourself, oh, I can't fall in love with this person or I'm not allowed to fall in love with this person, it just makes it that much easier to fall in love with them. That's, <laughs> that's the way we operate. I mean, look at what happened in Romeo and Juliet. Like... <laughs> You know, but I mean, that's a fictional example, but look at real life examples, you know, like gay people have been told for a long time now that they can't fall in love with each other for a long time. Interracial people, well, interracial couples were told that they can't fall in love with each other. And clearly telling someone that they can't fall in love with somebody doesn't change whether they will or not. Yeah. 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 And you can't have a contingency plan for absolutely everything either. Like you can't sit around saying, oh, I, you know, I'll make sure that I don't do this with this person in order to not fall in love with them or whatever. Or I'll make sure I'll tell every single person that I meet, like, I only want casual sex so that I don't fall in love. But you can't, like, just sort of make that happen all the time. It may happen of its own volition. Yeah. So, okay, so that said, I just needed to get that out of the way, that you can't control this. But... What I did want to talk about here is, and and he even got to this a little bit by talking about mm-hmm. how he loves his friends a lot. Yeah. And it's basically the idea of relationship anarchy, right? Is what if we were to look at these relationships not as romantic relationships? Because then we kind of put them in this different category where they have all these things that come with them, like falling in love or... Or cohabiting, or... Or or just that sex has to be more meaningful somehow when it's Mm -hmm. romantic, as opposed to when it's a friends with benefits or or something more casual. So my challenge would be to approach the whole thing from a little bit more of this relationship anarchy standpoint, where every relationship with any person, whether they're your friend or someone you're going on dates with, is just a relationship, and whichever parts you put in that relationship, whatever commitments you make together or whatever things you decide to do together, whether they would normally be considered more romantic or more sexual or more casual, that each piece just is a separate thing. Mm. And it's not as easy an explanation as just saying, hey, I want to romantically date you. (laughs) But I found that starting that conversation and at least having that can be really helpful when you are only looking for certain parts of a relationship for whatever reason. In this case, it's because your girlfriend can't can't handle that or doesn't want to have to handle that right now. But it could also be something mm-hmm. else. You just might not have the emotional bandwidth for that or you might only be in a place for a short time, right? Whatever it is, by approaching it more as I'm going to take each piece Separately, and we can negotiate when we're adding or taking away different pieces of this relationship instead of thinking it all has to come as one big thing, uh, which is where we get into these weird things like friends with benefits or people trying to just mm. keep things casual, which really means keeping distance. And, you know, we, we try to, kind of like Emily said, put other things in place to try to control our feelings. Yeah. Yeah, to piggyback off of that relationship anarchy thing, you know, you could have a friendship where you spend a lot of time with this friend, you know, like maybe you spend a lot of your free time, a lot of your energy, a lot of your effort to maintaining this friendship. And then on the flip side, there may be someone in your life that you're totally in love with, like total NRE, Mm. chemical release, all the endorphins, all the pheromones going, and you only see that person twice a year. 
you know, and so falling in love with somebody doesn't necessarily mean that it's automatically going to turn into something that consumes your life or that it's automatically going to be on this track toward cohabitation and marriage and raising a family. And I know that we're programmed to think that that's, you know, when that's that's our childhood nursery rhyme, right? Is that first comes, first comes love. love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage. <laughs> you know, we're programmed <laughs> to think of that whole escalator mindset when that's not necessarily the case. And so I'm wondering is... You know, he mentioned them already going through a catastrophic scenario, which Mm. we don't have the details on that. But was it catastrophic because his girlfriend assumed that that meant that if he falls in love with someone, that then I'm pushed out of the picture and someone else is getting all the time and and attention and devotion? Um, You know, we don't know. Yeah. No, I was just going to essentially say what you ended with there, Dedeker, that um, what exactly is the catastrophic scenario that she's imagining in her mind um, may happen if he does end up falling in love with someone else and then really deciding like, hey, is it because I'm worried that, I don't know, I'm not going to get my needs met or something and then sort of trying to figure out how those things can still occur even if he does fall in love with someone, mm-hmm. how she can still get her needs met even if he does fall in love with someone else. Yeah, I guess and that, is still that spending could be his use- time with someone else. A useful thing for him to evaluate is when there mm-hmm. was that meltdown and that fallout was it because he fell in love with someone and uh there was something that that his girlfriend needed that she wasn't getting that maybe the next time he could provide and that would be better or was it more that she was upset just by the whole specter and the idea of it because that one's a little bit more sticky and a little bit more difficult to to tackle well she needs to figure that out for herself as well though i think she needs to do some soul searching here too Yeah, and I think that question, though, can be really illuminating for both of them, is Mm -hmm. just that. Was the problem because he was wanting to spend all of his time with someone else? Which, I get it, yeah, I'll have jealousy if something like that happens. Yeah, But that's a little different from, was it just the fact that he was starting to have feelings for someone, that it was more the idea that was threatening? Mm -hmm. That could kind of help help uh, determine kind of what the best track is for moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, best of luck with so. this one. Um, yeah. Honestly, I think time is going to help yeah. with this one. But to get back yeah. to the question, though, before we move on, it's just for a second. Do either of you have anything that you would recommend for his question, which was, how do I enter into relationships with people that can only be casual, that are somewhat limited or that he wants to keep limited how can he approach those in a way that is honest and ethical and not you know leading anyone on i think he just needs to be up front at the beginning Mm -hmm. i mean clearly it while knowing in the back of his head anything that he may be setting a plan for may not actually work out in the end right he may end up getting more involved and interested than he even thinks that he wants to at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think that he can definitely, to use one of my favorite phrases, he can do 100% of his 50%, as in he can give 100% of his effort (laughs) Mm -hmm. in being upfront and honest and ethical, um, you know, and above the board in meeting somebody halfway, but that doesn't guarantee that someone's gonna feel be like okay cool just casual great like i'm then i'm gonna be okay with this relationship from here into perpetuity right you know because as we address feelings change and and evolve and unexpected things come up on both sides so yeah um obviously definitely maintain integrity to be honest and to be clear with people about your expectations um but understand that that may not necessarily set that relationship in stone as far as where it's going to go and what it's going to turn into. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would also add to that, that I think, I don't know if this is just for guys or I mean, if this comes up more often for guys than for women in dating, but I think we're taught to have a little bit of this assumption that if you are going about dating, only looking for more casual connections that no one's going to be interested. And Mm. The reality, though, is that there are plenty of people, male and female, who are are interested in just a more casual relationship, as long as it's one that's respectful and that makes them feel good. And so 
I do think, like what the two of you are saying, just approaching it honestly is is the best way to go about it and to just say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. And then if eventually, like we've said, you do fall in love in spite of that, that's something you're going to have to figure out when you get there. And hopefully deal with that ethically, yeah. too, and yeah. not just allow one relationship to ax the others. Or, yeah, to trump all the other ones. Yeah. For lack yeah. of a better word. But hopefully by the time you get there, your relationship with your girlfriend will also have progressed to a point where that's not as threatening. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So good luck, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So I did also want to say, I was going to say this at the beginning, that um, Dedeker, if, if you're watching the video at home, you will see that Dedeker and I are outside in this lovely courtyard here. But if you are hearing some crickets or maybe the chirps of geckos, uh, even occasionally some dogs barking. Just fucking enjoy it, man. Just enjoy it. Just feel just like enjoy you're it on, your work, on your work commute in yeah. the busy city traffic. Just, just imagine enjoy a little slice of nature of the jungle. That you're here in tropical Laos, where we are. From us to you. Yeah. That's our gift. That's our gift. <laughs> So please don't I'm complain to us about it. noise in the background. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. No, basically. Okay. No, I'm looking at it. Beautiful desert as well. So nice. it's oh, yeah. just I know, yeah, yeah, we're, all vegetation all the time. We're all on location this week. Oh, Emily's in Arizona and we're here in yeah. Fintian, Laos. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Yeah. Our all next right. caller here is calling about her partner's ex-wife. Let's, Let's listen it. to that one now. So my name is Veronica, and I've been listening to this wonderful podcast for uh, quite a few months. And first of all, thank you so much for doing it, because it's brilliant, and it helps us, uh, uh, th those of us who don't have a lot of experience with, with polyamorous relationships, to uh, find some answers and feel uh, less terribly alone. <laughs> um, so my question has to do with something you've tackled in many of your of your podcasts, which is jealousy. I started this relationship with a guy about a year ago, and um, we we're very much in love with each other. And from the beginning, it was clear that it was going to be an open relationship because uh, we we're both kind of on the same page about that, and that's the way we feel most comfortable with. Uh, the problem is uh, he is uh, he's divorced and. Um, uh, that was a very, very long relationship. He was with that woman for about 20 years. So there's a lot of memories and a lot of things that they share. And I don't know how to deal with this because it, it, it even surprises me because I, I was never really very, very jealous. Um, but I'm having trouble dealing with the fact that she is such a huge part of his life, um, although I know it's kind of useless for me to feel that way because it's not going to change or go away. H how can I deal with that feeling of not being as important in his life as this woman is, which is, I realize, something that's purely my own perspective. It, it It's not that way, but um, it's the way I feel sometimes when he shows me you know, some pictures or he tells me about their relationship. So I guess it's a bit contradictive uh, because when I think of him meeting other girls and developing feelings for them and um, starting relationships with them, I, I don't feel this jealous. But when it comes to his ex-wife, um, for some reason I do feel jealous. Um, can you give me any insight into why that could be or how to deal with that so that it doesn't damage my own relationship? Thank you so, so much. Wow. I mean, jealousy of the past, man. It can be a hell of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. Who wants who wants to start us off talking well, about this I, one? I, I mean, like M, it, yeah. Weren't you mentioning yeah. something earlier? Yeah, I mean, and, and it's interesting because she she said the word surprise, and I agree that I am often surprised at when jealousy strikes because, again, uh, like her, I don't really feel like I'm a jealous person, at least not anymore. But um, when it comes to, yeah, my primary partner's exes, and specifically his best friend, who is also an ex of seven years, um, I sometimes get jealous of their interaction and relationship, and I think it's just because, yeah, he also speaks very highly of her, really cares about her opinion, 
And to me, maybe it's a jealousy of their past and their history, and that that's something that, in a way, I feel like I could never compete with. And so to me, I, I think my jealousy, when we talked about our past episodes of where our jealousy comes from, that's, to me, like a competing jealousy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's necessarily the same in this way, but I know that that's where my jealousy specifically stems from when it comes to jealousy of lovers of the past. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, this one has also come up for me with uh, one particular ex of of Dedeker's. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess, mm, honestly, yeah. I've had this with exes of other partners as well, uh, where mm -hmm. there might be something, especially earlier on in the relationship, where it's like, oh, man, they really had these great experiences or they got to have these firsts together that we won't ever get to have because they've already been done. Um, yeah. And in the case with Dedeker's ex, you know, he and I overlapped for some time mm -hmm. as well. And that was also, there were some problems there too. So there's kind of levels and <laughs> levels of it. Read about in book. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. right, read about in Dedeker's book. Uh, but regardless of how you've ended up in this situation, it kind of ends up with the same thing where that relationship, at least as a romantic relationship, is over. Mm -hmm. But they still have an effect on this other person in your life. And so how do you reconcile this? And it's kind of like Emily was talking about this competition of, am I that important? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I just yeah. don't feel that important. Or it could also be this kind of fear of missing out. Like maybe I missed out mm -hmm. on their best years when they still weren't <laughs> jaded to the world. <laughs> you know? Damn. Uh, I've definitely had those sorts of thoughts as well of... Maybe I missed out on on the time when when they were their most receptive to having a relationship, and maybe I'm just getting kind of what's left over. And if you allow yourself to entertain those sorts of thoughts, it can definitely get out of hand mm. and mm. can become a little bit obsessive, I guess. Yeah. What comes yeah. to mind for me is um, a couple strategies to take on this. One of them is, I think, more of an internal strategy of of shifting your viewpoint on this so you have to think about the fact i mean it sounds like this person rationally understands that fear, right. that yeah, jealousy of the past sure. is, is not a rational thing that it that it is a silly thing you know and that it's not necessarily founded in something um and that it is all very much based on one's own perception so i think we got that part covered like that part's down and so now it's a matter of changing the thinking around it and Obviously, this was a 20-year relationship and yeah. had a profound effect on this person. And arguably, for better or worse, both when it was positive and when it was negative, helped to shape who this person is today. And that's the person that she fell in love with. You know, mm -hmm. if we want to get all cosmic with it, <laughs> you know, it's quite possible she never would have ended up falling in love with this person unless he had had this very important relationship. So yeah, good point. You know, it can, sometimes it can come from a place of trying to generate some gratitude for that, you know, gratitude that that relationship happened at all, because it means that now you have the chance to enjoy the fruits of that, essentially that you get to enjoy the lessons learned and the positive things that he took from that relationship and you get mm -hmm. to enjoy it in the present. So I think that's one way to shift thinking about it. You had another idea, Jace. Well, my other one that came up was thinking about this ex-wife as like a family member. And it kind of overlaps with what Dedeker was saying, but this idea that this person was obviously very significant, just like a person's parents or maybe their siblings or other people that they grew up with, that there's no way where you can ever have more history than those people, assuming mm -hmm. that they're, they're still in his life, right? That he had this 20-year relationship, and if he still has some kind of relationship with her, you're never going to be with him longer than that, assuming that that's still going on. Does that make sense? As in, if the relationship yeah. continues... Right. If future, you're counting both their, their to, married time yeah. and then also their current but, relationship. But wait, but are you counting time travel as a possibility here? Hmm, hadn't considered that yet. Or space travel. Maybe mm, they travel together yeah. and they're at near light speeds. And so, mm, 
Yeah, that could change things. Yeah, that'll All be right. something we'll tackle down the road, I suppose. Once, once, uh, <laughs> <laughs> once that becomes a thing that we need to worry about. Once uh, yeah. near light speed travel becomes more of a thing. Well, Maybe then jealousy of the past would become a perfectly understandable thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous of this partner you had who's now like, hundreds of years in the past because we've been traveling at sublight speeds <laughs> and so it's only been a few years to us but it's been hundreds okay, of years get, back don't get don't get all interstellar uh, on man, me let's let's sorry, bring it I back let's bring stuff. it back I around stuff. anyway right is to think about this ex-wife like a family member where they're not someone that you need to compete with i feel like because it's a past romantic relationship there can be more of this urge to have competition or to compare yourself to them But if you Mm -hmm. can think of it like this family member who just was there and had this important part of shaping who this person is, but that that's just it. But you're the one who's with them right now and getting to have the current experiences and develop your current romance and all of that and appreciate that they made that person into who you fell in love with. Yeah, and in terms of stuff that you can take away, some exercises maybe to do, again, it, try to figure out what it is that's causing the jealousy and what it is exactly that you want. For example, if you want like words of affirmation or if you want more quality time spent, and not necessarily to even put it as, I'm feeling jealous about your ex, so I need this, but to just say, like, hey, it would be lovely to get more quality time with you or whatever. Yeah, you know, this part of why this is upsetting or bringing up some negative feelings, it may be just highlighting like, oh, actually having my partner give some positive verbal affirmation of our relationship and of my importance to him is actually something that I need. And so, hey, maybe Mm -hmm. I need to ask for some of that. It doesn't mean that I need you to stop saying good things about your past relationship, but... Maybe I realize, oh, that is something that also I need. Maybe that's part of my love language. You know, maybe that's something that just makes me feel good. And I just want to have that too. Or again, as Emily said, could be verbal affirmation. It could be a matter of quality time. It could be a matter of building memories together as well. Yeah. I also wanted to suggest something that helped me a lot in dealing with jealousy of past relationships. And that is this issue of comparison. So if it's not really a competition Mm. thing, but more of a comparison of just thinking, oh, they've done all these great things and imagining that their time together was just so blissful and wonderful all the time. And that I know that our time together isn't always perfect all the time. Sometimes we're grumpy or sometimes a trip doesn't go as well as we'd hoped it to. And for me, what's been helpful is to make a list and try to look at evidence of why your relationship is important and meaningful to this other person and why there's lots of evidence that your relationship will continue as well as well as Mm -hmm. why there's evidence that this person really prioritizes you and that you are a big factor in shaping who they are as well. And I've found that as humans, we tend to be really good at finding evidence to the contrary we, we're really mm-hmm. good at finding evidence of why we don't matter or why someone else matters more than we do. And usually we are aware, we've seen or we've heard lots of evidence to support that we are important and that our relationship is you know, valid and healthy and going strong, but we have this tendency to ignore it. We have this yeah. easy temptation to just ignore those things. So yeah. making a list of your evidence that supports that can be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Who's next? Okay. I'll go next. Uh, so the other way that you can support us, if you don't feel comfortable financially supporting us yet, mm-hmm. um, is just <laughs> take a couple minutes of your time, go to iTunes or Stitcher and leave us a review. The reviews really do help us a lot. Um, it helps us show up higher in search engines when people search for things like polyamory or open relationship, things like that. And that helps us grow our audience, which means that we're able to reach more people and continue spreading all this love and knowledge and silly poly memes, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then last but not least. Awesome. Yes, so Quip, the lovely toothbrush company, we call it, Jason and I call it our acoustic electric toothbrush. What? what? But it's really, it's an electric yes. toothbrush. Yeah. The unplugged um, electric great. toothbrush? Yeah. It exactly. Like un- exactly. It literally is unplugged. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Deep. Oh. Yeah. 
teeth unplugged <laughs> or no that's good no toothbrush T- tooth- toothbrushes <laughs> unplugged so huh. dear Quibbs, we've yeah. been working on your marketing <laughs> yeah. and we exactly. have some ideas we'd and like to share here with you we've got it no well, but it's lovely um yes jess <laughs> d- well tell us about what it is <laughs> No, it, Quip is essentially a company um, the, to make a nice electric toothbrush affordable. And they come in a lot of pretty colors. They also do a refill program. Every single month I get every some three toothpaste. Sorry, yes, every three months I get a toothpaste um, in addition to my re- or new head for the toothbrush. Um, it's just a one triple double A battery and then a triple it lasts double, for like three double months <laughs> it's like triple A double it's A, a triple yeah a and then it lasts for three months yeah and they come yeah. in a bunch of pretty colors like mine is brushed gold and it matches my awesome laptop so and mine's anyways a cool if metallic you copper color yeah uh, and, and they also have is, some cute you know fun bright colors as well um, yeah but it's fantastic it takes the work out of getting your new heads replaced when you're supposed to you just get it in the mail it's like oh yeah right Mm -hmm. this is time to replace the head of my toothbrush as well as tips and things about how to actually take care of your teeth um they Mm -hmm. do a lot of research and working with dentists about what actually matters instead of all of the marketing gimmicks that are out there about whitening toothpastes and fluoride and all that sorts of stuff that it's the things that actually matter and the type yeah. of head for a toothbrush that actually is the best at cleaning your teeth and stuff like that. So it's been wonderful. I love mine. It's awesome for traveling. And, totally. Uh, yeah, I'm traveling right now, as are you, yep. and it's perfect. I've been traveling for a while so, now, and I love having my electric toothbrush with me that doesn't take up any more space than a normal toothbrush and yep. has a convenient little holder so I can just stick it in there and toss it in my bag. Yep, and you're good to go. So how do people so get if in you on want, this? Well, if you want one free refill with your first order, go to tryquip.com slash multiamory. And it's, yeah, essentially $10 off your first order, which is the entire um, refill for the first three months that you need it. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Right. Excellent. So, so you'll, tryquip. Your, your order will be the normal price, but then your first refill yeah. after three months will just be is free. free. Yep. Yeah. So tryquip.com slash multiamory. And we'll get a little kickback. So thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. All right. Ready to move on? Yeah, let's tackle this last question. Yeah, let's okay. do this. Here we go with our last question. Hey, guys. Um, I am a cis queer woman from Brooklyn, New York. I have been practicing poly for a couple of years now, and I generally do my best not to set any sort of rules in relationships. Um, some people call this chaos polyamory, but, you know, I just sort of embrace how life comes at me with one exception, and that is that I have rules with regards to um, sexual safety. I require that if I am to be fluid bonded with a partner, um, that they ask every other partner uh, with whom they share sexual relationships outside of me about their testing history and that they use barriers with those partners. Um, However, it's not particularly common in my community for people to rely on barriers for oral sex. Recently, the CDC has started warning Americans about a new strain of um, antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea that spreads specifically mostly through blowjobs. As a woman, I feel uncomfortable telling uh, my primary partner right now that he absolutely has to start using barriers with the women that blow him. Um, I intend to use barriers with the men to whom I give, with whom I share blowjobs in the future, but this feels like a really specific rule. Uh, do you think that it would be best for me to put the onus on myself and stop being fluid bonded with my current primary? Um, is this something that's fair to ask of them in light of the new CDC warnings? Is this a warning that you've heard about? Do you have any other advice to share with me? Uh, I'm pretty realistic with regards to the spreading of STIs. I understand that it's not a death sentence or the scariest thing in the world, but just something that you know can be avoided if possible with really non-burdensome for the most part uh, safety efforts but this maybe feels a little bit more on the line of burden on the other side of the line of burdensome um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts thank you so much 
before we, before we dig into this, I just yeah. want to say how much I appreciate the phrase of sharing a blowjob with somebody. <laughs> right. I do love that. I think that. it really gives... First, I mean, I know that you say you give a blowjob, but sharing mm -hmm. it, it just gives it so much yeah. more preciousness, I suppose. Like, you're sharing a gift. Yeah. Well, it is a well, gift. But, it, but where it's like, but you're enjoying the gift, too. Right. I think that's what it implies. I do yeah. like that. I like that. Of For like, sure. Of like, hey, do you want to share cunnilingus later tonight? <laughs> like, I like that, too, <laughs> Boy, right? do I. <laughs> <laughs> Because there is something in it. I for hope both you say it exactly. Yeah, where it's we're like, we're going to share this experience. It. It's not me yeah. just doing something for yeah. you because I want to win some brownie points or something. Yeah. Right. It's not this one sided, yeah. just mechanical thing that I'm doing. I'm, I'm involved too and in, in enjoying the process. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm All right. Start. So, I'm guys, okay. looked up. <laughs> Solved. No, totally. <laughs> You guys looked up some stits and stats yeah, regarding yeah. this. Yeah, so we had so heard, we of, share heard some of, of the um, we had heard of the CDC warning about the drug resistant. It's gonorrhea. been on the news. Yeah, it's been on the yeah. news. It's been making the media mm -hmm. cycle right now. But we wanted to yeah. again mm -hmm. look into it and look into actually what the CDC is saying, not just you know what all the media outlets are saying about right. it, because Which some is, of them are more accurate, some of them are yeah. less accurate. Um, so yeah. we did do some research on this one. Okay, what do you have to share with us? Or did you want me to... Uh, I can start us out. Okay. Um, first of all, something to keep in mind with the way that this story has been covered is that there is actually a big difference between a, a gonorrhea or any kind of bacteria or virus that mm -hmm. is quote-unquote drug-resistant versus one that is quote-unquote incurable. And the thing that I'm seeing in a lot of media coverage is those two words are becoming interchangeable when that's not necessarily yeah, not. the case. Um, because so far, there's no strain of gonorrhea that is totally resistant to every antibiotic. And I believe, Jace, you found that at least a quarter of all strains of gonorrhea are resistant to at least one antibiotic. And so the thing is, gonorrhea is behaving like any other bacteria or virus in that, um, to quote Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, uh, life I just finds have to, a way. Yes, life finds a way. And so, of course, <laughs> it is a life form. It is going to continue to try to find a way to survive. So it's mm -hmm. doing the same thing that all bacteria do, essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. So there, you know, there are some scientists saying that gonorrhea is doing this faster than some other bacteria, although there haven't actually been any studies that have proven that or have supported that. That's just something that some scientists are speculating. Um, here's the thing about this. It's both a really big concern and also not as big a concern as the media wants mm -hmm. to make it, obviously, because they want to sell newspapers. <laughs> Wait, no one sells newspapers anymore. <laughs> they want to sell wanna clicks. clicks. Mm, yes. They want to get some clicks. <laughs> yeah, it was like, magazines? No. <laughs> 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 newspapers have all turned into magazines. News, newsreel, newsreel flickers that they show before old timey movies. Yes, that's what they're selling. Yeah, exactly. Now. Yeah. Although it no, basically, you is, said, basically moved back to that. You said that, like in 2013, there was a similar story that occurred. Yeah. But then yeah. Now, yeah. So it just is kind of updating. But then again, there hasn't been any actual strain that has been 100% resistant or 100% incurable. Yeah. They've well, all been cured eventually. Yeah, the, other, the other thing to note about this is that they're not even immune to these different uh, antibiotics necessarily, but just that they're resistant to them. They're less sensitive to them than they normally mm -hmm. are, which is why the CDC in uh, 2016 is when I think they started this, is recommending that gonorrhea always be treated with two different antibiotics simultaneously. Um, Interesting. Because it might be resistant to one or the other, and those two working together will be more likely to treat it. Because basically, the thing about this is that it is a serious problem, but the serious problem here first of all, is that less than half of the cases of gonorrhea are detected and reported to the CDC. So first of all, people not getting tested mm -hmm. is a big problem. But the problem is that people are contracting these and either getting a treatment that's not working while continuing to spread it around, or mm -hmm. they're just not getting detected at all, which is an even bigger problem, and it's continuing to spread. So... 
part of the problem here and that's also like all strains of gonorrhea not all just, strain, just in general not just yes, this resistant yes, yes, one, yes, yeah. Yes. yeah um that part of the problem is that there are not a lot of labs that can detect for the resistance and anticipate it uh especially not many labs for that can resistance. get those results back quickly enough so that you yeah. can prescribe a type of antibiotic that's actually going to work so that you can get it treated and get it taken care of right away um Again, not only is it not this death sentence, but it's also not this incurable thing. Um, at least not yet. Now, hopefully, as a society, and hopefully what the CDC can be successful at doing is finding better ways to both get this detected and get people aware of it, which maybe these news articles are doing, even if they are creating more of this scare tactic to do it. If they are getting mm -hmm. people more aware of it, hopefully this could help to control it, especially amongst certain high-risk areas and high-risk populations, mm -hmm. that we can, can you know, limit this spread and also get it treated quickly so that we could even potentially eradicate this if people were all getting tested and getting it treated. Mm -hmm. We could get rid of it just like many cities have gotten rid of rabies in dogs just by vaccinating for it and by treating it as it mm -hmm. comes up. Yeah, wow. so... I mean, just to also kind of calm people down a little bit, that every case of, of this particular strain of gonorrhea that was like super resistant mm -hmm. uh, was cured. That right. they exactly. found the right uh, antibiotic cocktail to give it in order to actually cure it. So no one's been incurable. Nobody's mm -hmm. died. Nobody's genitals have rotted off from this particular strain. Sorry to put that image in your mind. Um, of course, it is still a cause of concern, but that is the good thing is that hopefully that this is spreading more awareness and that the CDC, because they are aware that this is a thing, they are doing their best to try to stay ahead of it and hopefully starting to incentivize better research, push for more antibiotics, um, you know, incentivizing research companies to start working on better antibiotics, not right. just for gonorrhea, but for many things as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, okay. So, so that's that's all about gonorrhea. <laughs> that was some stits and stats and, and kind of looking at this realistically. Yes, it's something worth taking seriously, but at least my takeaway from it is that the big lesson is really encourage your partners and your friends and also practice what you preach yourself of getting tested frequently. Yeah. Mm. Because even if you don't have any symptoms. Right. If you don't have symptoms, just get the regular tests done. Um, and this, you know, gonorrhea and syphilis and chlamydia are covered on the normal tests. That's yeah, the standard panel. Right. right. We've yeah. talked before about how there are other ones that they don't normally test for. You have to request specifically. But these ones are on your just standard Planned Parenthood or wherever you go. These ones are on those standard tests. And then you can do something about it and stop the spread of it in your community. Mm -hmm. So... Oh, are, but you bring, now, are you bringing us back? But now I'm bringing us back. Okay. So really, just like with anything else with sexual safety, it comes down to this question of what risks am I willing to take versus what, you know, troubles am I willing to go through, if I can call it that, mm -hmm. right? Like which steps and barriers and you know, waiting to get tested before having sex with someone or whatever these limitations are you're going to practice, what's the balance of those that you want to practice for yourself to maintain a level of safety that will allow you to feel comfortable and feel good about your choices while also enjoying your sex life? Yeah, yeah so in this particular situation, that boils down to essentially does the pleasure of fluid-bonded sex, does that justify... Um, the added stress of making sure that your partner's being totally fastidious in using barriers for oral sex with the stress of making sure that your partner's partners are being fastidious in their use of barriers with oral sex and other kinds of sex and that they're on top of their STI screening. Is it worth the stress of hoping that your partner's partner's partners are also being good about barrier usage and are also staying up to date on their STI panels, are also honest and trustworthy and forthright if if anything came up, if there was any symptoms. And of course, you can just mm -hmm. keep on going through that network. And um, and then on top of it, also the stress of, it sounds like you're wondering, like, is this too much to ask of my partner? Is my partner going to resent mm -hmm. me for this? Is this realistic to ask? So it kind of weighing, does the joy of fluid bonded sex balance out all of that stress? And there, yeah. there is something that I want to commend this caller on is 
the way that she phrased her rule, she said she just has this one rule, um, but she phrased it in a way that sounded a lot more like a boundary, which I actually really mm. respect. And I feel like if you are going to approach these sorts of things, that is the way that we recommend doing it, of not saying, for example, someone who's a partner of mine has to do these other things with their other partners and they all have to be tested and they have to follow these rules. But instead, what she said was, if someone wants to be fluid bonded with me, these are some things that I require, right? Yeah. So it's not about necessarily putting it's this rule her, not on about someone else. It's saying, well, if you want to do those things, then we can be fluid bonded. If not, we won't be fluid bonded. We can still be together and we can still have sex and still have a great relationship. And she's even said, maybe that's the answer is to stop being fluid bonded with this. Mm. Uh, I think she called him a primary partner. That I do like that, that it is at least being phrased as a boundary. Um, part of my answer to this would depend on his reaction to it. That mm. maybe his response is, sure, yeah, actually that, that makes a lot of sense. Like, I'm totally happy to use barriers for oral sex with all of my other partners because to me that is worth this same risk assessment, right? Mm. That this risk assessment is for both of you. Is it worth taking all these extra steps in order to be fluid bonded together and not have that little inconvenience with each other? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the part where, at least for myself, uh, it isn't worth that with any of my partners to be fluid bonded and then have to have all of that worry about everyone else and put myself at potentially more risk if they have a partner mm -hmm. who doesn't follow those rules or if they don't or whatever. Or even if you just have a partner and the condom breaks and they get exposed, it sure. doesn't even have to mean totally. that somebody's being dishonest That's or true. not trustworthy. It can yeah. just be straight up an accident. You know, it Something happens all the can time. just happen. Exactly. Yeah, right. Things happen. So yeah. for me, that's not worth it, but that's just my choice. And everyone has that choice too. So part of this question to me relies on how he feels about it as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I know this is going to be echoing something that we covered in a recent episode. Um, but I always, I always feel that it's a more empowering choice to choose to protect yourself rather mm -hmm. than just relying on other people to protect you. And I'm going to use the same metaphor that I used. And I know you guys are sick of it already, but I still love it, which is it's more empowering for you to choose. I'm going to put on a seatbelt and drive defensively and follow traffic laws rather than I'm going to drive however the hell I want and not wear a seatbelt and just hope that everybody else follows the rules and drive safe so that I don't have to worry about it. And I mean, that's an extreme metaphor. I'm not saying that you know, it doesn't sound like this caller is super reckless with her no, sex life or anything like, like that. It. But, no. you know, we would call that ridiculous of somebody to not take those precautions for themselves. And this, I think the same thing applies to, with safe sex. And so I feel like her options here are, are as she mentioned, um, she can choose to not be fluid bonded. That's totally okay. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean anything about how important or not important your relationship is. You know, it's just a piece of rubber. That's it. It doesn't mean that you love each other any less or trust each other any less. Like it just, that's all it is. Any meaning right. that is attached to it is the meaning that you attach to it. Or if you do want to choose to be fluid blonded, fl fluid, fluid blonded. If you want to be a bleach blonde, <laughs> <laughs> if you do want to be fluid bonded, or honestly, even if you aren't fluid bonded, you can request. Uh, you can choose to get tested more frequently. You could ask your partner to get tested more frequently. Um, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and see how they feel about using barriers with other partners. Yeah. Because it also helps that they will be fully on board with whatever it is you're doing, too, and that it's not a burden that you're putting on them. It's not something they feel like they have to choose, but it's something that they're willingly choosing because they've decided it's worth it to have this unprotected sex with you. Mm -hmm. So basically we're just asking for open and honest communication. Always. Yeah. And Always. that it comes Which from both sides. Like the, the our reason, bottom line, <laughs> the reason why I really don't like the concept of rules. And it sounds like this caller mm. doesn't really either is because yeah. it, a rule implies that it's one person putting a rule upon somebody else. Right. Where they're enforcing it and there's punishments in place and it's something that someone else kind of gives to another person. Here's the rules. These are the rules you have to follow versus 
an agreement that the two of you have made together, which it sounds like this one could be. And it might already be heading that direction if you're having these conversations. Um, yeah. So thank you, caller, for calling in with that. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. We had a lot of, like, very aware callers yeah, this I time. Know. It was it's lovely. Great. Like, they were I very self-aware. It. I really well, appreciate no, Last that. time, too, we last had some very too. good yeah. self-aware yeah. callers. No, like, I so know. far, everyone's been pretty great. I found in general, too, also with the, with the Facebook group, I've noticed mm-hmm. that, too, that a lot yeah. of people who are drawn to our show do have a certain level of self-awareness that I do really is that, appreciate. Is that, is super is woke. just trying to give ourselves a big head? Maybe. It might be. We're All great. of the people that listen to us are super woke. They're so woke. <laughs> They're so smart. I'm sorry. I don't understand that. No, you guys are wonderful. All of you listeners are wonderful. Yes. Bah, bah, I love bah. you. And I love you. you. Okay, we have one last fun little message. Oh, yeah. Which is in response to our previous... I love this uh, so To one much. of our callers from our previous question-answering episode, which was a couple of months ago. Here we go. Hi, I'm calling in response to episode 122 with the guy called about uh, wanting to be cuddled and not knowing how to get that. You guys gave a great summary of, I think, the main options available. But one other option that you didn't mention is dancing especially Argentine tango. People who dance Argentine tango are essentially doing a 12-minute hug, and they tend to be people who are very touch-oriented and enjoy that kind of thing in a a non-sexual way. And so uh, I would suggest that this guy look up some places where he can take tango lessons. There are other dances as well that that can give you a similar kind of thing, Um, maybe, maybe salsa, perhaps ballroom there, there's a bunch of dances out there that you could try but I know that Argentine tango is exceptionally high on the cuddles so good luck okay so first of that. all for our YouTube watchers I do appreciate that they'll see that what we think Argentine tango is is <laughs> kind of dancing like it's a muppet shimmying your shoulders around a little bit just kind of swaying around yeah. and moving your head about no so that's great Watch True lies. It's been it's <laughs> been a, a while yeah. since I've been in a tango class, but last I remember, I don't think that's what I it was like. However, I will say no. that I do have several friends who are tango dancers, and they cannot get enough of it. And I think maybe this is mm. part of it because my friends who are tango dancers, it's not just about dance; it's not just about exercise. It really does fill their social meter because they mm-hmm. go to like late night malangas where it's like a party. And you get to dance and touch people, and and you kind of get your need for touch and your need for interaction. And they would go like five nights out of the week. I never understood it. Sounds like a blast. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, totally. So I'm totally into this. Obviously, I mean, yeah, it's great. Some and people don't know. Like, I was a professional dancer for many years. Um, yeah. And uh, in the past couple of years, started getting into ecstatic dance and contact improv. And I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm all about it. Like, definitely contact improv. For, That's another good one for getting yeah, your touch. For getting needs your touch met. needs met for sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, p- the people may not oh, know. Oh, acro yoga. Oh, yeah. Acro that's yoga. a good one. That's another that's yeah. good one. Yeah. 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 For sure. Anyway, I love this whole, you said yes. this whole avenue of, of dance yeah. as a way to do that. So look into these. So look into Argentine tango, contact improv, uh, acro yoga. See what's yeah. around you. E- yeah. Ecstatic dance, you don't really touch other people as much, though, well, right? Well, the, the ecstatic dance classes I've gone to have also incorporated contact improv oh, they into have. it. Okay. Yeah, so that... And for those of the, you who are listening who don't know what contact improv is, um, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> Great. Um, Great. That was it's, incredibly helpful. It's <laughs> an improvisational form of movement meditation slash dance where it's like you're trying to constantly keep contact with another person's body and you're just kind of making it up as you go along and moving to particular music and it can mm-hmm. be very abstract and very modern and very hippy dippy but I don't know it's nice it's it's like you get into this really organic rhythm with somebody um, and I found that with ecstatic dance classes that also have contact improv sometimes they have similar rules to cuddle parties as mm. far as initiating some kind of contact-based dance with somebody and when somebody politely is done, is full, essentially, like ways to break away without somebody's feelings getting hurt, you know, and understanding that, like, just because you initiate contact with somebody doesn't mean that they're obligated to take part and they may not, and that's fine. Like, there's actually a little bit of overlap there. 
Interesting. I did a lot of contact improv in college, uh, mm. but haven't done it. Of course, it. Oberlin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and part of that was we would have a weekly contact improv jam where, where it would be a similar kind of negotiating dance and contact. And you can just, if you're done with that person, you can just kind of move on and move somewhere else and maybe you'll run into them again. But there is a little bit of that. Yeah, less of an attachment to, I've chosen a dance partner, so now I've got to stick with them for the whole yeah. rest of this song or something yeah, like that, yeah. which which can be nice. But anyway, Argentine yeah. Tango, if you like something a little more structured and a little more appealing to your non-hippie friends. <laughs> uh, anyway, I hope our, right. uh, I have a feeling that our caller from last time is listening to this episode, mm-hmm. so yeah, go I, I think so. check that out. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you all so much. I love getting to answer oh, this listener is great. questions. This is this a long is one, great. but I'm yeah. happy that we let it go it's long really because long this one. is great. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody who called in. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I love I love these episodes where we get to actually hear what's on people's minds, what's going on, and gives us so much to talk about. Clearly, I feel like we could have done a whole episode about each of these questions. Yeah, seriously. Uh, so this is great. I really love it. Um, if you want to have a question on the show or if like our last caller you have a quick little response to somebody else uh, you can call our number which is 678 M-U-L-T-I 05 um, I'm going to so do some Argentinian tango too. area code yeah. Area code 678-M-U-L-T-I-05. Or you can leave us a voice message through our Multi-Amory Facebook. Uh, either one of those ways, you can get your question played on the air, and we'll discuss it the next time we do one of these. We really appreciate it. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from you and hearing all the questions that you have. Also, if you want to email us, you can reach us at info at multiamory.com, or you can send us a message on Facebook. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram or other places. <laughs> Basically, we're, we'll just search a- multiamory on whatever social media you like, and you'll probably find us there. Um, if not, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lundgren, Dedeker Winston, and me, Emily Matlack. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh Anand from the Fractal Cave EP.